Good evening, and thanks for joining us for tonight's Fox 29 Investigates with Rhonda Kitchens. Was it greed, jealousy, or bitter anger that led to the death of 66-year-old Pamela Parker? Her body found inside her sulfur home, from all accounts, a bloody scene. But the killer or killers would do something that would let investigators know this murder was personal. Here's Fox 29 News, Rhonda Kitchens. A 66-year-old widow brutally murdered in her own home. A family member arrested for the crime and later released. A year later, the murder of Pamela Parker remains unsolved. A family divided. So what happened and why do investigators believe the person responsible is close to home? Tonight, we untangle a web of lies. I squatted down to look between the shelves and I seen her foot. Sarah Parker says her Aunt Pam was dead on the living room floor. The investigation would spark intense family fighting. Who did it and why? They had Sarah in jail, second degree murder, a million dollar bond, and they let her out. Michelle was the one that she hated Aunt Pam. She hated Aunt Pam. So how did a family spend so far out of control? I'm trying to get some help to get her removed off the property. Okay. And what happened inside this house in July of 2014 that ended in Pam Parker's death? Whatever it was, it started long before. Cool settlement out there. It's all family and uh, just good, good people out there. That was until neighbors say the community was taken over by drugs. Even this building that Parker allowed those down on their luck to live in turned into a meth lab. I'm not gonna name no name, but you know, they, they was producing it. And we called in two or three times, you know, trying to get some help. They were routing the building in the back to go to the house yeah. up front where the electric bill was normally 150, 200, mm -hmm. the, it was $900. They'd come in and they'd take all the food and they'd already stole all the, the money out of the credit union and everything. So she didn't have the money to pay it. Even more shocking is the person Sarah says was behind it, Pam's adopted daughter, Michelle. We went up to the sheriff's department, did, did an eviction notice, had a restraining order, Still, she says, Pam was afraid. She had some little blue weights that would stay on the couch, and she, Michelle used to just pop this door open and come in any time she wanted to, so my aunt felt like if Michelle did that, that she'd use the weights for protection. But it would be the killer or killer, Sarah says, that would get their hands on those weights. I thought maybe... She might have been asleep, I didn't know. So was it the weights that they hit her with? That's what the report said. My aunt, you know, she was murdered. Somebody went out there, and I know now there's like four people there, and I know how scared she was. So how does she know how many people were inside the home? Sarah says that's just one of the stories circulating about the murder. Another, she says, came from a family member. She said that she heard that Aunt Pam ran in a room and tried to close the door and protect herself, and she didn't make it. I just looked there and said, you didn't hear that. You didn't hear that. It's a, it made me wonder if she wasn't here too, you know. We spoke to that family member, and she says that conversation never happened. But when they say stuff like that, I just know they tortured my aunt. They tortured her. Sarah would be the one to discover her aunt's body days after the murder is believed to have taken place. When I came around before I even got up on the porch, I had a horrific smell. I thought it was a dead cat. And, uh, but I went ahead and went up on the porch, and the front of my aunt's door is glass, you know, the little place of glass. And it, she had a sheer, sheer pink uh, lace curtain over it, but you can see into the house. And uh, when I approached, uh, I seen her bathroom door was just straight directly in front of there, and it was cracked open, and the light was on. And that had happened so many times before that when I'd knock, she would come out with her little makeup thing, putting on makeup, but she didn't come. And uh, 
she wouldn't sleep in a bedroom because my uncle had just died in the bed. So she had a little love seat, which was kind of short, and she would sleep on that love seat. So I thought maybe she was asleep. I, I tried to angle myself so I could see the love seat. And I, I was looking through the side, and I seen what I thought was her foot. And, and they had these two big old double windows, and she had a flat screen at the top, but I, I dunked down, and then I seen my aunt, I, I seen her foot, and I seen the top part of her femur. She would run to her brother's trailer nearby. If Pam's on the floor, I think she's dead. Uh, he went around to the side there, and, and this time, at this point, I'm already in shock, and I don't want it to be gone. <laughs> And I knew about the smell, you know. And uh, the the side door was open. It wasn't locked. And my brother opened the opened the door, and the smell just comes out. And uh, but he closed it. And then he said, "Call 911." And I told him I was a CNA. And they told me to try to get in to uh, perform CPR, but I couldn't get in. You know, I tried best hollering for her, hollering for her, I couldn't get in the door. Thank God that I didn't go in there. Sarah Wood returned to the home multiple times after the murder, and on this day she would walk us through the scene, our cameras rolling. One thing that was strange, those blinds were open like they are now, and they never had been before. And there's a TV stand right inside, and somebody pushed it over. So I, I came over and I, I squatted down to look between the shelves, and I seen her foot. So show me again, you're looking through here. Uh -huh. she this one back. was open. It, you can see, you can see real easy in there. And there was a recliner right there and the love seat was right here. And her, she was laying like this. And then she was covered up. Now you said that the blood had gone through to the floor. Is that the spot you're talking about? All yeah. that right there? Yeah. I think she was, her head was a little bit more down like in, in here. You know, and I think that's actually some blood right there, too, where her, her leg was. Now, whenever you looked through the window, you didn't see the blood? Um, yes, I, I, I did. I did see the blood, but it was, uh, no, at first, I, I don't think I did, uh, because I, I, I was freaking out because she was on the floor, and all I wanted to do was get to her and help her. When did you notice that, that there was blood? I think when we were all trying to look in and everything, that's when I could see, you know, it was a dark spot on the love seat and on the blue carpet and everything. So the love seat had blood too? Oh yeah. It was, they were saying something like a crime of passion, you know, because she was covered up. And it, I was just freaking out. I'll never get that, that out of my mind. Sarah was questioned and let go. She would travel to Gina, Louisiana, where Pam's funeral was taking place. It, it was said that not to open anything, you know, no open coffin or anything. I thought they was just trying to hide. They wanted to keep what happened to her secret because only the murderer would know. I stood over that box. I stood over that box my aunt was in. And I told her, and I meant it. The last thing I do, they would pay for what they did to her. By the time it was all over with, they incarcerated me. So is this where the web of lies would begin to unravel? And her brother called me. He said, why did you tell the law that Sarah and Aunt Pam got into a fight? I said, I didn't tell the law that. Pam did. Pam told him. Coming up, would the victim's own words solve her murder? Fox 29 travels over 100 miles in search of the answers when Web of Lies continues. A lot has been said about Michelle Parker in the days following her mother's murder, and she admits she wasn't an easy child to raise. I'm, I'm manic, and I'm bipolar, and I went my whole life pushing people away because I'm different. I dress different, I act different, 
I'm not somebody that you talk to normally on the streets. Many of her problems, she says, stems from a rocky relationship between herself and Pam. Every family has their dysfunctionalities and their wrongdoings, but with forgiveness that we all come around back to loving each other, you know. I forgave my mom a long time ago. And she says the news her mother had been murdered was almost more than she could bear. I paced around in my sister's driveway for a good 30, 40 minutes, just repeatedly saying, let me find out. Let me find out who killed my mama. Because at that point, it, you know, nothing but question marks is up. How do you even absorb something like that? How do you accept the unknown? And then I found out later that afternoon by detectives that I'm being accused of killing my mother and that Sarah was saying it. You ask me, who do you think would have done this? Who what would have done this to you? Aunt? And I told him, I said, the only one that's ever threatened was Michelle. And what about that eviction Sarah told us about earlier? My mother come and got me and moved me out there after I had left, after the eviction that she's talking about was right after my dad's death. It was a year prior to my mother's, year and a half. She went back out to the property and was staying in the house while my aunt's blood and stuff was still on the floor. Went out to my mom's property. This is after her death. It'd been a couple of months. I hadn't even blinked in that direction because I'm still devastated, you know? Go out there, we have a gun, you know? I had a gun. I didn't know who killed my mama. I wasn't going unprotected. By the time of Michelle's arrest, Sarah was already behind bars at the Calcasieu Correctional Center on the second degree murder charge. I had to sit in that jail and look at her face from sun up to sundown every day. Family member versus family member, Michelle fingers pointing in every direction. You're still pretty convinced Sarah's the one that did this. Oh, yes, ma'am, but she didn't do it, but you know, she was involved in it. And until I'm proven different, that's just my belief. It's kind of funny, you know, you go get a wheel made, go get a life insurance policy. It's just, it's, something's not right. I know this is family, but my mom don't deserve this. So when somebody says, no. I didn't do this, Michelle did this, what do you say? Not a chance. There's not a chance. Could the other family members be right? Did Michelle's past just make her an easy target? Until now, the people you've met in this story have all lived or had close ties within a few miles of Pam Parker, none actual blood relatives of the victim. But now the web expands some 136 miles away in Gina. We traveled there to speak to Pam's cousins, childhood friends, lifelong confidants, and one of them may be holding the answer to her murder. I think several of them killed her. Me and Pam had talked that week, and she had Facebooked me, and she had sent me a lot of messages, and then she'd call me, and she'd send me messages, and she'd call me. And um, one of the messages was um, she wanted me to um, call and Sarah. She said she might raise him with you. But reason with her about what? In hours of interviews with Sarah, we never heard anything of a disagreement between her and Pam in the hours before Pam's death. And I talked to Sarah and I said, Sarah, what's going on? Pam says she has no groceries. She has a brand new Cadillac. She has no way to the store. Y'all need to bring her car back. She said she calls her baggy. And um, she was like, oh, you know how baggy is. It's nothing like that. And we're, bring, we're right here. We're bringing her car. But the car wasn't returned. And Amy says Pam wanted her to call and report it stolen. And then she Facebooked me and she said um, she had talked to Sarah herself, finally, because they wasn't answering her phone calls. And obviously it had been for days. And she said, Sarah and them are so mad at me. They're on their way with my car. She said, um, they will probably take my computer. The tower belongs to Sarah, so stay by the phone. So I called her, and she said, I think I'm going to go to some of Vernon's people's house. But I continued to call. The calls were never answered, and Amy grew more fearful by the day, even messaging Pam to see if she wanted them to pick her up ahead of her intended trip on Sunday. 
Oddly, we would hear about that message first from Sarah. Amy said she got a, a text saying that Aunt Pam said she didn't need her to come get her. And it, it had dot, 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 and that wasn't like my aunt. She was immaculate with the writing, you know. And uh, Amy felt that was how Michelle would do something. So she felt like that Michelle was the one that sent that text. Me and Sarah never had that conversation. Never had that conversation. But I did get a message like that, that's true. That wasn't Pam. Pam didn't send me that. The last message Pam sent me was, and I can remember it just like it was yesterday. She said, I talked to Sarah's sister. She told me everything's gonna be okay. They're bringing my car, and for some reason, she was hung up on $1,500. So I'm just gonna stay here, hang around, and fool with these lagging bills. Call me when you can, or I'll see you Sunday. It's the last message I got. By Sunday, Amy says she was in a panic. I told my husband, I said, we need to get up and go on down there because we couldn't get a hold to her. So I got on my Facebook just to look because Pam stayed on Facebook and I seen a post from Michelle. A trip meant to bring her cousin home instead turned to tragedy and fear. We were scared to death. We were scared to death. We didn't know what to expect. She was the type of woman that would help anybody. She opened her home up to people who might not have been the most savory people, but she was trying to help them, you know. So I'm pretty sure whenever she opened her house up, she didn't plan on getting murdered behind it. The day they Sarah called in and said she found him, found his body, well, there was not a soul around. It was like everybody disappeared. All them people that hung around, hung around, hung around. Then when they, she reported eight pounds body, she no one was here. Like they was forewarned or something. So did the people in the building have anything to do with the murder, or was it even closer to home? According to Pam's text messages to me, she said, somebody is dipping into my account again. I'm not quite so sure that it's Michelle. Messages, Amy says, that were no longer private. I know we were on our way to Lake Charles and I get a phone call. And it was Sarah and she was crying a bit. And she said, uh, Amy, why did you tell Baggy not to trust me? Which we, I did tell her that on the computer. The only way she'd have known it was if she read our conversation. Could that conversation have been what sent a killer over the edge? If it was their mama, I guarantee you somebody would have done been put in jail. Coming up, will there ever be justice for Pam Parker? It's not an easy case, and it's not an easy case because the people involved are all basically not telling the truth. Are there even more suspects to consider? The answers when Web of Lies continues. It was about 10.30 in the morning on July 20th. My Aunt Cindy had come to the house and told me, I need to tell you something. And I said, okay, and she told me Pam's dead. And it took a while for me to realize what she was saying. I just talked to my mama. She was okay. And then they're telling me that she's no longer with us. When you heard it was a family member that had been arrested, what did that do to you? Honestly, it didn't surprise me. With the family member that I was told, it didn't surprise me. She's a 66-year-old woman. What could she have possibly done to deserve a death like that? Was it something she did or something she owned? Sad part about it, there's relatives who keep fighting over this property. I mean, I don't understand it myself. When she stayed with me Thanksgiving, you know, it was, she'd get a phone call from Sarah, they're taking your land. You know, they kept her upset all the time over that piece of land, and the whole family fights over it. Sarah told Aunt Pam I was trying to take her house and property. I own my own land right through the woods. I don't need this. The house, Sarah says, originally belonged to her great-great-grandparents. But could a piece of land drive someone to murder? If so, those messages Amy received from Pam could have sealed her fate. Well, Pam told me on that message, she said that she wanted to come back to Gina. But she wanted to wait on her car and stuff. And um, she said, I'm going to come to Gina and I'm going to sell my land down here. And she said, I'm going to put a trailer and just live by y'all. She said, I've had all of this I can stand. And I think when they found out that she was moving down here, 
But I know when they found out and read that message, she was moving. They weren't gonna let it happen. They went their car, their income, their way to get their drugs, everything. Pam's death would only fuel the fire. Eventually, after they released the house, I went in and got all of the paperwork because I knew I was the executor and trustee. <laughs> I went and got all the paperwork out of the filing cabinets and everything, and I've done been through it a dozen times. That will is gone. The will, as it turns out, is no good anyway. It was never filed into record, making it invalid. So what about the insurance policy? Sarah explains how that came about when Pam purchased her car. An old boy, after he told Aunt Pam she needs some life insurance. I didn't understand that part, but uh, Aunt Pam got the life insurance and with the car note and everything. As soon as we left the State Farm, it, it, I never had enough thought about it. That was until Pam's death. We needed to get my aunt's body transferred from Sulphur to Gina, Louisiana, where she's from. The funeral home and everything, uh, uh, if you'll sign the papers, they'll use the, the money from the life insurance. And I was like, great, you know, got, got her coffin and everything. We had her funeral arrangements made at Robinson. Me and Connie, Ronald, and Justin went down there. And because her and her sister went and changed it, she had to come down here in a box, a cardboard box. We had her coming in a casket, a very nice one. Still, Amy would allow Sarah to stay in her home while she was in town for the funeral. Nobody liked it in the family. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Sarah, I'm gonna tell you something. Sarah and Pam had a very good relationship. And Pam loved Sarah. She loved her dearly. And I thought, Pam, I thought Sarah loved Pam. At the time, Sarah had not been named a suspect, but Amy was already getting an uneasy feeling about what happened to her cousin. And I told my son, I said, Justin, I said, I want you to sleep on our gun. I said, because I think we got the murder in our house. Sarah had a really bad smell to her, a bad smell. And when we arrived at the home and opened the door, me and my husband looked at each other and said, there's the smell. It smells, she smells just like that house. And you'd have to be in the house a while for it to cling to you. And I mean, she took a bath, she showered. She couldn't get the smell off of her. The Sheriff's Department asked my mom if she would go meet him at the Sheriff's Department and pick up Sarah and bring her home. My mom said, all right, so I rode with my mom to the Sheriff's Department. We get there, we're sitting there and we're waiting. We're, we're there for a couple of hours, I know. And the whole time, all Sarah seemed to be worried about was what she was gonna get. Aunt Pam willed this to her. She willed that to her. She's getting this. Not one time was there any remorse from my Aunt Pam. That's whenever I told my mom, something's fishy about this. I don't want to be involved in it. Let's go. And she doesn't have much to say to me or my sister, except for, I'll buy, I'll buy you this or give you this. Just sell the house to me. I'm not selling my mom and dad's house. That's why it was given to me to keep it in our family, and I'm not letting it go. I don't know who killed her. I want to know just as much as anybody. And although it's contradicted by others, Sarah says she has an alibi for the time of the murder. I was in Houston, Texas with my son in Houston, Texas, and the car had an OnStar. My son used that OnStar to get from one road to another in Houston the whole time we were gone. And we didn't come back till uh, we hit Lake Charles about 6, 6.30 that Thursday night. I kept calling her. I called repeatedly when I was in Houston. She didn't answer the phone. So I assumed that she went to Gina. So were the charges oh. dropped? Rejected. Rejected. They were rejected. Judge Davis rejected the charges. It went from a million dollar bond to being released. I don't think that that changes our thought process about what we believe happened. Don't think we made a mistake. Uh, I think that we just need a little more piece to the puzzle. Still, Sarah says there are other suspects to consider. Sarah's been trying to implicate my sister in this from day one. Look into my eyes and tell me, you think I could kill my own mother? Then there's a former boyfriend of Sarah. And once I allowed him to, to come into my home, there was no getting rid of him. Jade says she had a run-in with Sarah and her boyfriend at her mom's house just days before Pam's death. 
And I told him, this is not your property. And over my dead body, will you step foot back on this property? You need to leave. My mom wants you off her property now. And I didn't see my mom after that. We looked into that man's criminal past, and he has troubling charges, including an arrest for child pornography. So would such a person cover his victim? As if the long list of suspects weren't enough, you also have to weed through the stories, untangling each as the web continues to grow. And it's hard to get the truth from this element of our society. Listen as Sarah tells us about an encounter with her uncle Vernon as he lay on his deathbed battling cancer. He sat up in the bed, straight up in the bed and hollered. And a boy said he hadn't had it in six months. Ho hollered, get her, get her, watch her. And he was talking about Michelle, Michelle was standing right there. At first, the story seemed a bit odd. By all of the family's accounts, Michelle and Vernon were very close, adding to the discord between her and her mother. But then we heard the story from another source, in another light. And he looks just straight at me, and Sarah was actually standing against the wall. And he points at her. And he looks at me and he says, watch her, watch her, get her, get her. I cannot sit here and honestly say Sarah did it herself, right, right. but I do feel as if Sarah and several other family members know a lot more, know a lot more. We want justice, and we're going to get justice. We're going to get it. So who did it? While we may all have our ideas about the case, only investigators know the strength of their evidence. Hopefully the information we've gathered will help lead to a conclusion so Pamela Parker can finally rest in peace. For now, a killer or killers continue to walk our streets. Thanks for joining us for tonight's broadcast. We will continue to follow this story and bring you more information as it becomes available. For all of us here at Fox 29, Good night.